Good morning and welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of High Point, North Carolina and this week's online worship service. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning. My name is Lee Zemer and I am the transitional pastor here at the church. Now this morning I'm taking the rest of the Labor Day holiday as a prompt to reflect on the commandment to Sabbath keeping. Why did God institute the Sabbath? And why is it important for us? Well, we will explore these and other questions as we consider Laborless Day. Now, let me remind you that we do have two in-person worship services every Sunday. Our first worship contemporary service is held at 9 a.m. in our Family Life Center, and our traditional service is held at 11 a.m. in the sanctuary. Now, due to the rise in the COVID cases in our community, we have returned to asking that our in-person participants on Sunday mornings wear masks as a way to protect the most vulnerable among us. But we expect this to be temporary. And of course, we will continue offering our online service for those who are unable to join us in person. But wherever you might worship with us, I pray that you will be blessed. So let us turn to this morning's worship service. May the peace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Please join together in our call to worship. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that we should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. The Lord is our portion. Therefore, hope in him. Let us pray. Gracious God, you faithfully wait for us. Graciously reach out to us. We gather together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that from him we might know of our welcome, that with him we might continue on our journey, that in him we might serve you and your people. Therefore, we pray in his name and in the power of the Holy Spirit, ever rejoicing in your glory, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray together, confessing our sin before God. O oh God, we are running so fast, and we don't know how to slow down. We are busy and yet not satisfied. We are moving faster, but we never catch up. In all of this rush, our relationship with you gets pushed aside. Forgive us. Speak to us once again your message of peace, of walking beside still waters, of refreshing our souls, of lying down in meadows of green. Enable and empower us to spend time with you as we rest in your love for us. We ask in our Savior's name. Amen. Hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you then in the name of Jesus Christ, your sin, my sin, all of our sin together is forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sin strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, we come before you this day ready to hear your word to us. So we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our wills that we might receive what you are going to teach us. We're so thankful for those who went before us, who wrote down these words so that we might be able to hear from you through them. And so, Lord, speak to us through Jesus' name. Amen. I have three passages of Scripture for us this morning. The first comes from Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, His disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to Him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Our second reading comes from Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then our third reading comes from Jeremiah 17, verses 19 through 23. Thus said the Lord to me, Go and stand in the people's gate by which the kings of Judah enter, and by which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. And say to them, Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem who enter by these gates. 
Thus says the Lord. For the sake of your lives, take care that you do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day or bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. And do not carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath or do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy, as I commanded your ancestors. Yet they did not listen or incline their ear. They stiffened their necks and would not hear or receive instruction. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever found it curious that a day set aside for celebrating labor is observed by taking a day off work? As I pondered this observation, I became curious about the origin of the Labor Day holiday. I don't ever remember having learned about it in school, so I did a little research about its beginnings. The first Labor Day in the United States was celebrated on September 5th, 1882 in New York City. In the aftermath of the deaths of a number of workers at the hands of the U.S. military and U.S. Marshals uh, during the Pullman strike, President Grover Cleveland put reconciliation with labor unions as a top political priority. Fearing further conflict, legislation making Labor Day a national holiday was rushed through Congress unanimously and signed into law a mere six days after the end of that strike. The form for the celebration of Labor Day was outlined in the first proposal of the holiday. It was to be a street parade to exhibit to the public the strength and esprit de corps of the trade and labor organizations followed by a festival for the workers and their families. Now, while Labor Day had its origin in the political events of the 19th century, over the years the day has come to be known by most Americans as the symbolic end of summer. Most people see Labor Day as a day off of work, a time for cookouts and rest, and perhaps the last chance for a weekend at the beach or mountains. And as I thought about my sermon for this week, I thought it would be interesting to look at a different kind of resting from labor, the kind God expected of the children of Israel. So much so that He made it one of the Ten Commandments, keeping Sabbath. Now the word Sabbath, or Shabbat, or Sabaot, literally means to cease or desist, and it was a weekly day of rest and abstention from work that began at sundown on Friday and ended at sundown on Saturday. And its origin traced back to God's resting after the sixth day of creation. We read in Genesis, and on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. Now it's important to note that God completed creation by resting. Resting was not something He did after finishing creation. Let me say that again. God completed creation by resting. And so resting from one's labor was God's intention built into His creation. Now when God made His covenant with the people of Israel following the Exodus, keeping Sabbath was one of the commandments. The Exodus version of the Sabbath commandment reminded Israel of God's creative work and in remembering what God did, they would honor God by keeping the day of Sabbath. We read, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day it is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." Now the Deuteronomy version of the Sabbath commandment 
instructs Israel to keep the Sabbath in order to remember how God rescued them from bondage in Egypt. We read, Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So remembering what God did at creation reminds them to keep the Sabbath, and keeping the Sabbath reminds them of what God did for them in the Exodus. Well, let's fast forward past the wandering in the wilderness, past the entry into the Promised Land, past the judges, past the kings, all the way to the fall of Jerusalem and the exile. For hundreds of years, the Sabbath had been the cornerstone of Israelite religious practice, and Sabbath keeping was one of the marks of being a follower of God. However, following the fall of Jerusalem and the exile to Babylon, the practice of keeping the Sabbath had fallen away. The widespread mood of religious despair and indifference, a disorganized populace, and a weak leadership made many in Israel feel like it was irrelevant. In the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah proclaims to the Israelites that God wants them to recapture the practice of keeping the Sabbath. And if they do, if they begin to observe the Sabbath as a holy day in which no work was done, then there would be a great reward, that being the restoration of Israel to the place it had before its conquest. That by practicing Sabbath, the Israelites would be expressing their hope in God that God would restore their fortune. So throughout the ages, the Israelites have practiced the Sabbath to some degree or another. And the Jewish writer Achad Ham famously wrote, More than the Jews have kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept the Jews. Meaning that keeping the Sabbath has been the one practice that has maintained Jewish identity over thousands of years. Now, of course, we are not Israelites, but the instruction to keep Sabbath as part of the Ten Commandments has been given to us as well. And yet, much like the Israelites of the exile, keeping Sabbath is seen by many as irrelevant in today's world. Many Christians have exempted themselves from the Sabbath commandment. And there are a number of reasons for this exemption, but one of them that is best known is because of these words from our Mark passage. By the first century, the Sabbath keeping had once again become a cherished practice, so much so that a whole human constructed tradition was built up around the proper practice of Sabbath keeping. Pharisaical tradition stated that there were 39 acts that were strictly forbidden on the Sabbath which included kindling a fire, gathering fuel, using a sickle to harvest grains. The tradition even informed the people how far they could travel on the Sabbath. So in short, the Sabbath day had become a crushing burden, a symbol of religious bondage that had captured the nation. So in this context, while walking on a footpath through someone's grain fields one Sabbath, Jesus' disciples began picking some heads of grain to eat. Now, while Deuteronomy 23-25 approved of this practice, the Pharisees viewed what they were doing as an act of work that was forbidden on the Sabbath, and so they demanded an explanation from Jesus. Now, note that the accusation is not that the disciples were stealing, but that they were working on the Sabbath. Well, Jesus responded to the Pharisees with a story from Scripture where David and his companions were in need and hungry, 
and they broke the rule about eating the consecrated bread, which was supposed to be just for the priests. God did not condemn David, and thus this episode showed that human need took priority over ceremonial regulations. But then Jesus made two very important statements. First, he said the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. Or in other words, God created the day of rest for people's benefit and refreshment, not for it to become full of oppressive responsibilities. Jesus would not approve of a legalistic approach to the Sabbath in which no work could ever be done regardless of the circumstances. The Sabbath law was created to help people, not to harm them. Now, Jesus' second statement was that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And here, Jesus claims authority to decide what is the appropriate use of the Sabbath. He was saying to the Pharisees, you, you may have made up some laws about keeping the Sabbath, but I have the authority to decide the proper way to observe it. So what does all this have to say to us? We know from Scripture that Christ has set us free from the burden of the law. And it's clear that Jesus didn't view the Sabbath as a bunch of rules to keep. So is there any value in keeping the Sabbath? Well, first off, we need to understand that the Sabbath is a divine gift from God for the well-being of God's people. It's not about following some pharisaical rules or trying to appease God. That God gave us the Sabbath for our own good, to be a day of rest when God says it's okay not to work. It was never God's intention for the Sabbath to become laden down with legalistic, puritanical regulations. It was meant to bring balance to our lives. Really, the Sabbath is a way to draw closer to Christ. It's one way to keep us from idolizing our work and putting our trust in our ability to provide for ourselves. That when we set aside a day of rest consecrated to God, it says to the world and to us that God is the head of our lives. By resting for a day, we are making a statement that our life in Christ is far more important than any extra income we might make by working that extra day. And in fact, for Israel, keeping the Sabbath was a way of being purposefully less productive economically so that they could place God first. As God intended it, Sabbath keeping is really our offering to God as evidence of God's priority in our time, just as giving a tithe is evidence of God's priority over our wealth. It's about discipleship. And you know, I, I think Sabbath keeping can still be a mark of the people of God. There is a difference between experiencing a day off and having a day sanctified to the Lord. When people are unable to eat at Chick-fil-A on Sundays, they know it's because the owners are Christian. And so Sabbath keeping can also be a witness to our faith that, that if we are Sabbath keepers and someone asks us to do something we feel would be work-related, we can say no and give the reason why and thus witness to our faith. Now, of course, someone's going to point out that the Sabbath was the seventh day of the week and Sunday, the Lord's Day, is the first day of the week. So let me say just a brief word about that. The reason we observe Sunday as a day of rest and worship instead of Saturday is because Sunday was the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. And as a remembrance of Jesus, Christians have taken the first day of the week as their Sabbath. But the idea is the same, a day of rest, a day consecrated to God. Now, of course, some Christians cannot observe Sabbath on a Sunday. For ministers, Sunday is not a day of rest and is not a day to cease and desist from work. It is not a day that is easy to concentrate on family and one's relationship with God. And so the idea is that those who cannot take a Sabbath on Sunday is to pick any day, a day that can be set aside for rest, a day of worship. Now for me, I set aside usually Fridays. But I've got to say that I'm not very good at Sabbath keeping. More often than not, I end up doing some type of work on Friday 
But I do know in my heart that I need to take this command much more seriously than I do. So let me ask you a question. Do you need a Sabbath? I mean a real Sabbath. Not just a day to relax, but a day to rest. Well, I think everyone needs a Sabbath. And yet few of us really take a whole day to rest, to worship, and to deepen our relationship with God. Let me also say that even today we have to rescue practicing Sabbath from the idea that it's a day of do nots. Do not do this, do not do that. Oh, Sabbath is a gift from God that gives us permission from the Creator of the world to cease from activity and to take time to put things in proper perspective. Sabbath is a gift, not a burden. As part of my Doctor of Ministry studies, I did a doctoral project on keeping Sabbath. And in that work, I discovered some practical things we can do to set aside a day for Sabbath, to consecrate a day to God. And the first thing clearly is stop doing what you need to stop doing in order to have a day of rest. Now perhaps this might mean buying a good answering machine and not returning phone calls for 24 hours. <laughs> there really is very little that is that important that it can't wait a day. Now if you need to screen calls to make sure you don't miss family, that's okay. But perhaps this might mean turning off the TV and computer for a day of rest and spending the time with family doing something special. But the primary characteristic of the Sabbath is rest. So whatever allows you to rest is what you do on the Sabbath. If cutting the grass is restful for you, by all means do it. But if you make a living cutting grass, that's not rest, is it? Second thing we can do is to select a few favorite activities to do each week that will become a ritual for you, something that will set apart the day as something special. Now this might be lighting candles around the house or, or taking an afternoon nap uninterrupted by the phone or taking a leisurely walk with family or cooking a special meal and inviting friends over for a shared meal or praying for one another, asking for God's blessing or studying a good spiritual book. But whatever you choose to do, you do it weekly and you let it become something that makes Sabbath a joy, that it sets it apart for you. And certainly, use your worship time, your church service, as a way to open yourself up to God to be healed. And this is about attitude. You see, you don't see coming to church as a burden or something else to check off your list. Instead, you see it as a God-given gift to lift you into God's presence where God will refresh you. You see worship as a way of deepening your relationship with God, that you come in joy rather than out of obligation. You see, God doesn't want to force people to come to worship. God doesn't want people to come to worship because uh, something else they want to do is just not available. God wants people to come because they prefer God to everything else. You know, we, we take ourselves too seriously, and God not seriously enough, when we fail to observe the Sabbath. Remember that the Sabbath was given to us not as a way to kill our fun, but as a gift, as a permission from God to rest. And God knows in our culture today we need some rest. Let me close with this story. Uh, there was one man who challenged another man to an all-day wood chopping contest. The challenger worked very hard, stopping only for a very brief lunch break. The other man had a leisurely lunch and took several breaks during the day. Now at the end of the day, at the end of the challenge, the challenger was surprised and annoyed to find out that the other fellow had chopped substantially more wood than he had. I don't get it, he said. Every time I looked over at you, you were taking a break. And yet you chopped more wood than I did? But the winning woodsman said, but you didn't notice that whenever I sat down to rest, I was sharpening my axe. There's so much truth to this story that without the God-ordained rest, ultimately we will get done, less done for ourselves and for the kingdom of God. And so may God help us 
to take seriously this gift of rest given to us in this Sabbath command. Thanks be to God and amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you are a God who hears our prayers. We give you thanks for the promise of your Son, that whenever we pray to you in his name, you hear us. It is then in the name of Christ that we make our intercessions this day. We pray for this community and for your church all over the world. As you shape us for service, show us the good that we may do. We pray for the mission of your church and thank you for the joy and encouragement we receive from you through our church family. Give us the grace to plant faith and build love wherever you lead us. Almighty God, on this Labor Day weekend, we are reminded that your Son, Jesus Christ, dignified our labor by sharing in it himself. Be with your people where they work. Help all of us to see our work as service to you and your people. Give us pride in what we do. Watch over the ways of business so that those who buy or sell, get or lend, may live justly and show mercy and walk in your ways. In our dealings with each other, may we display to the world your love and mercy. Yet let your love, O oh God, surround those who are sick, troubled, grieving, lonely, misunderstood, or abandoned. Be near to them. May they know your love as it is embodied in the presence of your people who express concern and do what they can to bring medical attention, therapy, social work, encouraging words, gifts of service, and other help to any who are in need. Gracious God, we thank you for the measure of faith you have given to each of us. Increase in us generosity, compassion, courage, diligence, cheerfulness, and humility, so that we may continue to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ in the world. We praise you with lips that confess his name and ask that you hear our prayers that we offer today. Hear us also as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The grace and forgiveness of God shown to us in Jesus Christ is a gift that nothing can match. The greatest response we can make to this gift is to live according to God's will. And as a part of that response, we bring a portion of the resources that God has entrusted to us as a thank offering. We pray that God will multiply the offerings of our lives and resources to further the work of Jesus in this world. And so let us bring our gifts and worship this day, either through our online giving links on our church website or by mailing them into our church office. God will bless you for your part in this generous undertaking. Amen. I'm 
My friends, no matter where you go, God is sending you there. Wherever you find yourself, God has a purpose in your being there. That the Christ who indwells you wants to do something through you where you are. Believe this and go in the power and grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen.